So um, this, is gonna, this slide is just a brief overview of what I'm going to be going over today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the data manager for the Deep End Consortium, and I'll tell you about what kind of data they're collecting, what their goals are. So that would be the first portion. Second portion will be um, online data visualization using Joomla and Google Maps. So this is any kind of GIS data you have. Um, it's very easy to get these things online, and I've produced several websites that I uh, would like to show you. And then finally, I'm going to talk about my own research. Um, and the reason I want to do that is because my research uses open source data, and it uses uh, online websites and GIS. And so it kind of ties together all these different themes um, using, uh, using modeling. So um, as far as the oil spill, uh, the top image here is this happened back in 2010, and the spill ran for about four months or so. And this top image was something we saw in the news a lot, many, many images of floating oil. However, um, the spill itself actually occurred in about 1,500 meters worth of water. And a lot of the oil was actually distributed um, in these mid-level depths. So um, you know, we only saw a very small portion of this oil on the surface. So um, right after the spill, there was a lot of interest in trying to determine what kind of effect this oil had on this um, mesopelagic zone. So from that, um, BP was, um, they basically paid for research for a bunch of different consortiums over a period of 10 years. Um, we were fortunate here at NOVA to land a uh, very large um, grant last year and uh, we formed the, the Deep End Consortium, which stands for Deep Pelagic Necton Dynamics of the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this is a consortium that uh, consists of 11 different institutions, all listed here, and about 17 PIs. But there are a lot of employees um, you know, working on this one project. So um, this is the scope of work statement. I'm not going to actually read the whole scope of work. But um, this is a three-year project that com uh, consists of cent uh, uh, remote sensing, laboratory analysis and modeling, um, ecosystem dynamics, and basically we're trying to determine um, the causes or the effects of the oil spill immediately afterwards and also five, ten years into the future. And we're also going to be doing some back casting to see, you know, um, what possibly the ecosystem was like before the spill. Um, so basically we're, we're collecting baseline data. And we're doing this in the mesopelagic depths and also some epipelagic. So it's that mid-level that is not really studied very, very much and also very deep um, waters far away from shore. So I'm going to go through all the different types of data that we're going to be collecting um, and the different focuses. Um, we have a huge amount of data that we're going to be collecting and we're just starting this process. So I'm still learning about all this as well. So. Um, I'll share what I know as of this point. Um, one of the main components is to actually go out and do sampling. So we're using something called a Mach 10 net, which is very interesting. Um, it's a series of nets, actually, that um, open and close at different depths and so that we can sample all throughout the water call. Uh, we've done two cruises so far. Uh, this is the cruise track of the first one. Um, and we sa sampled six, six different stations. And just in this one initial cruise, we collected 212 different uh, species of fish, including one that is a new species that has not been documented before. So this is a very short trip. So there's a lot of unknowns out in these deep waters. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention in the beginning, if I want this to be pretty casual. So if you have any questions, just throw up your hand. And I, I won't be talking the whole hour and a half. So hopefully you guys, if you have questions, please ask. Go ahead. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Tracy Sutton. That's based out of Nova. Yeah, he's an expert in that mesopelagic realm. It's very interesting going into their labs. They've got tubs and tubs and tubs of, you know, uh, creatures, crazy looking creatures. Um, uh, there's there's going to be a series of uh, photos throughout all these slides. As part of this project, where um, we have a professional photographer that's actually going out and photographing every single specimen that we collect, and it's also going to be part of a data library for ph photography. So it's some very, very, very cool imagery. So um, 
that's the mesopelagic depths that we're going to be sampling. We're also sampling the ichthyoplankton, which is the small fish in the surface layers. This is done out of Texas A&M University. They use something called the Neustadt and Bongo net. I'm not even sure exactly what those are, but uh, that's what they use. This was one of their cruise tracks. They've also had two cruises so far this year. Uh, there's going to be a total of 12 cruises, and each of the, one of these is for a period of about 10 days normally. We are going to be doing uh, sampling of microbial assemblages. So at each of these stations, we'll be sending down a canister, which will collect water, and then we'll bring that back to the lab. And Joe Lopez here will be actually doing the analysis of that so we can see if there was any effects on the oil on these microbial assemblages. Alpha taxonomy, everything we collect um, is brought back here and to um, some other institutions and they're ID'd to uh, genus and species level. <clears throat> and this is gonna compose then a very large database of a taxonomy database at the end of the project. Um, we're also doing genetics. So everything we collect, we're not only identifying, but um, if we don't know the genetics of it, we're also running uh, those types of tests. So of course, genetic um, testing creates massive data as well. Bioacoustic oceanography, um, we spoke about this a little bit earlier today. We have um, an investigator that is using um, acoustics to sample uh, the water column. And what he can actually determine is these layers right here are actually uh, uh, schools of fish. And you can actually determine the, the density of the fish, sometimes even the sizes of the fish. So this again is a large amount of data um, as this is done on every single cruise. <coughs> Mesoscale oceanography, we are also have PIs that are uh, running forecasts of ocean currents. This is the HICOM model. This is done out of the Naval Research Lab. This is probably our largest data set. Um, <clears throat> we're running this daily every year or throughout the year for the whole Gulf of Mexico. And so this produces massive amounts of data. And this is also at 30 depth layers. So it's not just surface currents. <clears throat> Uh, mesoscale oceanography, again, um, combined with the uh, HICOM, we are sending out a glider, which is going out. It's like this little submarine thing that goes out and actually measures water temperature, depth, all those things, and actually is used to um, correct the forecast <coughs> by HICOM. So again, this is quite large data as well. <coughs> Ecosystem connectivity. So um, we're not, there's not a lot of a not a lot of not of knowledge about how these mesoplastic depths are related to these shallow depths. So that's one of the things we're going to be investigating is how um, larva or other organisms may connect between these different depth layers. This is actually a larval lionfish, which they collected way, way, way out in the deep pelagic waters. So they do float, and that's how they move about. Excuse me. Um, contamination and sublethal effects. So uh, we're not really sure. Immediately after um, we, we went out and did some sampling, not this group, but a previous group, and they did find high levels of PAHs and PCBs within the tissues of these fish. So as part of this project as well, we will be uh, sampling to see if those levels increased because of bioaccumulation or if they decreased, um, you know, just to see what you know, what some of the effects of the oil and the actual fish assemblages were. <clears throat> and then we're also going to be looking at the popu population genetic status. So we don't know if these, these uh, contaminants actually genetically altered some of these creatures um, or had an impact. This graphic kind of shows what would happen if there was a bottleneck event or an extinction event because of this. The population would, you know, dive and then it would either go extinct or it would recover after some period of time. We don't know if this has happened or not, but this is one of the things we're going to be looking at. So the whole point of going through all of that was just to show you that we have a very wide variety of data and data types that we're going to be collecting. And like I said, I, we're still in the process of collecting this data. So as it starts to roll in, we'll probably see the full scope of, of this project. It's a massive project. So um, <clears throat> Deep End is just one of the consortium. There are, I'm not even sure, 15 or 20 different consortiums, all studying the Gulf of Mexico spill, all studying different aspects of it. 
Um, and all of this data is um, fed into a uh, massive data repository. And this consists of 286 institutions, 229 projects, 3,200 researchers, um, and 885 separate data sets over a period of the 10-year study. The data itself is managed by the Gulf of Mexico Research Institute, our Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative Information and Data Cooperative, which is otherwise known as Grid C. And this is all housed at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. They have a whole team of people managing this whole data project. And <clears throat> I was at I was at the we have an annual data manager meeting, and I was um, there in August in Austin. And BP, a representative, was there, and the Gomery board was also there, and they really emphasized that the data is the legacy of this entire project. I mean, that they're emphasizing, you know, there will be studies and papers that come out, but what they really want is this baseline data. So it's very, very important. You know, they've spent billions of dollars to fund these people. They want to see the data that we're going to collect. So it's a very important component. Now, at the, grid, at the data management um, meeting, I was fortunate enough to uh, meet a lot of the Grid C staff. They're very uh, young, fun people. Went out with them several nights. And so I was able to get a better feel of um, you know, their system. <clears throat> now, I didn't mention in the beginning, but I, I was a programmer for many, many years before I came into marine biology. And so I understand our IT quite well. And so I kind of dug into their brains to try and figure out what their system actually was made, how their system was built. So um, the interface that we see to GridC is uh, using Drupal, which is a content management system, which I'll talk about later, um, content management systems, um, analogous to Joomla, which is one that I use and I'll also talk about. But this is what we actually interact with when, as data managers and PIs when we upload our data. Um, the data itself is uploaded directly by the consortia members, and then this is housed at Texas A&M on their uh, replicated file server. And all the data, uh, the, so the, the files themselves are on the file server, and the data paths are hosted in a Postgres uh, SQL database. So they're not actually storing the data in the database, they're storing references to the data in the database. And they use a ticketing system. Um, which is used for any kind of issue management. Um, this is pretty typical setup of a IT type, um, you know, department, which is what GoodC basically is. So, as as part of this whole process, you know, we have um, all these uh, consortia, and in order to get a handle on, um, you know, how GoodC was going to manage all this. Um, each of the consortia had to come up with a data management plan, which I understand is you guys have been working on this week. Um, I did provide a, a handout. I don't know if you have it somewhere. So this is an example of what Grid C wanted from us for their data management plan. Now, every kind of you know, data warehouse or organization would be different in what they would require, but I'm just going to go through the, the different points that we were required to cover in our data management plan. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, a lot of it was basic information, personnel, contact information, the, the lead PI's contact information, my own contact information, and then the specific roles and responsibilities of the investigators and the data manager themselves. <clears throat> um, data integrity, this of course is very important. Um, if you're submitting data that is not useful data, then there's no real you know, reason to even submit that. So data integrity is a very important portion, um, making sure it is what it says it is, it, it works, you can open it, it's useful. We've pushed this off to the PIs mostly, or I should say I've pushed this off to the PIs mostly because I'm not an expert in their data, they are the experts in their data, so I'm relying on them to make sure it's complete. Now Grid C does check this when, after we submit it, so um, we're going to know if they're submitting bad data. Um, but I am, I'm overseeing the process as well. <clears throat> as far as data infrastructure, now we are using NSU Works. Uh, Michelle will be up talking about this next. We are primarily at this point using NSU Works as a sharing tool um, for data within our consortium. Um, NSU Works, by the way, is a content management system, basically. So you can upload any kind of data sets, documents, etc., 
there's permission levels, all those security measures. And um, as I mentioned, we're using that within our consortium so that each investigator can see what the other investigator has done and use their data. Um, also very important, in-process data backup. So you have to have a, uh, you know, a solid backup plan. Um, we produce all this data. Oftentimes when you're producing data, you're modifying things, saving it, modifying, saving things. And you don't want to lose all that. Um, that is your product, basically. So as part of the data management plan, um, we have to know how that in-process data is being backed up. Most people, most of our PIs have a file server where, like we have here at Nova, where you can upload to the file server. The file server is backed up nightly. And so that, that, that fits. <clears throat> Other people, um, we are actually using NSU Works for part of that as well, because NSU Works is, again, backed up. In the beginning, some people were using external hard drives, which <clears throat> is not a very robust way of backing up your data. So we had to, you know, get on people and say that, you know, this isn't 1990. Let's, you know, there should be a better way of backing up your data. In online data, you know, there's Google Drive, there's, uh, you know, all those different online services, Amazon Web Services, all those can be used as data backup. They're very, very um, efficient for that. And finally, um, final file type naming conventions. So we had a number of cruises, a number of trawls, and so we came up with a standardized way of naming all of our files so that at a glance you could see, you know, what ship it was on, when the trawl was, all that. Now each consortia um, was assigned several tasks, and this basically is just a grouping of what their research was going to cover. Um, we were assigned, and this, is, and this basically answers the who, what, when, how, and how much, um, and that also needed to be included in our data management plan. For our five tasks, we are covering taxonomy and community ecology, organismal ecology, genetic diversity and connectivity, acoustics, and physical oceanography, all that stuff that I showed you in the beginning. Those are our five specific tasks. Now, from Grid C's point of view, they knew in the beginning what our tasks were, but they had no idea how we were going to tackle these or what kind of data we were going to produce from them. So in order to, for them as a planning document, because they needed to plan the infrastructure, they needed to plan storage, they needed to plan all this in order to house our data. So we created um, data, data set information forms, and this is a requirement of Grid C. And they're submitted online, and those are done right in the beginning of the project, um, and is a, basically planning for all the data we're going to collect and process throughout the whole project. So the data set information forms, or diffs as we call them, call them um, are completed again by the PI because they are the experts in their data. And then the um, diffs are also checked by me usually because not everybody's super computer literate. So I double check everything, make sure everything's correct, and then we submit them to Gritsy, at which point they review it and come back with changes usually. So the, the diff contains baseline information uh, for Grid C's benefit, expected file types, uh, ex file type extensions, the sizes, the abstract, what's actually in the data. This is very important because when people are searching for the data, they don't want to have to download everything and find out it's not even close to what they wanted. So we have to have a very good abstract. The geographic extent, this is all, um, you know, all of this data is collected in spatial, uh, different locations, so it can actually uh, be depicted um, on a map. So the geographic extent of all the data that we've collected also needs to be um, reported. And then the variables measured. So uh, much of this data is tabular data um, in a database, in a spreadsheet, so they want to know all the variables that are found in the data. So, um, yes, so the, the one of the requirements of uh, Gomri is that the data must be registered within their system within one year of collection. So basically we have one year from the time that we actually collect the data. We have to process it, do whatever, get any publications out, and it needs to be in grid C within that one year. And that's that's because this is, you know, this is the whole point of this data set is it, it's a public data set. 
you know, and it needs to, there needs to be transparency in the whole process. So um, they're, they're um, you know, they don't want us sitting on data years after we've collected it. Diffs are used to populate the data registry. So all the information we collect in the beginning is actually used to populate the registry so we're not duplicating work. So those planning documents, you know, it seems like a huge pain, but when you go to register it, it's good because all the data pulls in and you can just modify what you need. Um, a lot, most of the data, well, I'd say about half the data goes directly to Grid C itself onto their file servers. And the rest of it, um, some of the very large data sets, the gene, uh, geno genomics data sets, the acoustic data sets, um, the HICOM, those are all housed on outside repositories just because the data sets are massive and there's already those repositories set up. So we simply link to those from within Grid C. So the data is not actually housed there, but it is linked to. And then finally, there's metadata. And metadata, you probably have talked about, I'm thinking, um, is basically the who, what, when, where, how much. This describes your data. So when we have a, when you have a researcher or the public going in and saying, okay, I want this data set, but what's actually in this data set? What do I need to open it? What do I need to do all this? Uh, that's what metadata is, and it's very, very, very important. Grid C has set up a metadata editor online. So we simply go in and fill out the form. It's using this ISO standard, and it's then attached to the registered data set. So as I said, when people are going in to research it, they can simply go read the metadata, see what it is, see if they really want it or not. It's what they want, then they can download it. Otherwise, they just don't have to. So as I mentioned, it's, it's extremely important for consistency, legacy, and accessibility. We want to make sure this data is available for future generations, so it needs to be standardized. So this is a, a I, I created this a while ago. This is a um, just a flow chart, basically, of how the whole process works. I don't know if I need to go through all of it. I kind of explained it all. But basically, there's three pieces. There's the information collection piece, which is uh, composing, getting all the data from the people what they're going to be collecting, composing the data management plan. The second part, and this is the stage where we are right now, is um, in the data collection and processing data phase. So, you know, we've planned for everything. Our researchers are going out on these cruises, collecting data. They're doing whatever they need to do for it, to it. And then once they have a product that can be uploaded to the open access database, they will go through the process of registering the information with Grid C, at which time Grid C does a whole other set of QA QC checks to make sure they're getting what we told them we were giving them. They send it out to subject experts. And then if everything passes, which I hardly doubt they normally pass on the first try, I don't know how that's, that's going to go, but um, if, they're, if they pass, then they're made publicly accessible. So it's a very robust system. They've, you know, they've been doing this now for six years, so they've got the process down quite well. So if you want more information on the, data, uh, the Deep End Consortium uh, process, the website, what we're studying, all that, go ahead and go to this website right here. Um, this is the web portal, and I'll show this portal actually in a little bit too. <clears throat> all the information is right there. So that's the piece on data management. Does anybody have any questions about that?